your hostess, Mandy Cantrell. Well, things have just been very busy during the Christmas and New Year's season, but we and things are starting to settle down a little bit for most people. But at the Comer Library, we are very busy. Are. Joining me today is our li library director, Dr. Shirley Spears, and she's here to tell us about our South First Bank brown bag series. This winter it is turn back time. Turn back That's time right. and if anybody out there is wondering did I get it from the share song? <laughs> <clears throat> I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did. I listened to her a lot in my car, and so I'm always looking for a good overall title. And um, I heard her singing about Turn Back Time. Huh. So anyway, I thought, well, you know, that's exactly what we do with our Brown Bag series. Most of the time, we do history uh, programs. Wow. If they're not history, they come from a different era of history. Wow. So we actually do sort of turn back time. But I'm so glad to be able to come on and appreciate TV 47 so much, yeah. and also for sponsoring for us. All these things help us to get the word out and to get good presenters and to have good programs. Yeah. And of course, we're kicking off, uh, Mandy, with our jazz program. Yes, Wednesday, January 14th. We are, are at 12 o'clock noon. Of course, we have that social hour from 11 till 12, 12, and we had some, have some good refreshments, and you're supposed to bring a sandwich and come in and let us do drinks and refreshments and that sort of thing. So that works out very well, and people seem to enjoy the fellowship. They do. Yeah. They really do. We have so many husband and wife wives that come in, and then maybe it's people with a friend, and they will enjoy a sandwich and sitting at the table together. But Buddy Simpkins puts this program together for us, and we revisit it as often as we can, bringing the historic black musicians in. Uh -huh because they're like me, they're getting older. <laughs> and you think, well, you know, one of these days they won't be able to get out and travel and come to the B.B. Comer Library and do this. I'm glad so they can, they are excellent. They are wonderful, excellent. and so we take advantage of Buddy putting this group together, and Buddy's wonderful. He has so many groups that he works with, like the Heritage Hall Band, and yeah. then with different groups. He just, his, his influence is far-reaching. But he puts together Bo Berry out of Birmingham, and Bo's a trumpeter, and he is renowned. He has played with some of the biggest groups in the country. And uh, this year, uh, we're having a new bass player, and his name is Jeff Drew. Okay. And he plays with these guys, and he's a sort of a backup because Cleve Eaton <clears throat> is having to have surgery actually on his arms and hands. But Drew is his his backup and the person that they say is just so wonderful. So we're counting on that. And then out of uh, Goodwater, we have uh, Kermit Orr, who is a wonderful pianist. I mean, he really has played with some of the greats and uh, played with the Fort Benning band. He was in the military for a long time. I enjoy having him so much. He's such a gracious, nice man, and he can play the piano. He can. Well, about three or four years ago, uh, the group started inviting Elnor Spencer, and she's a vocalist out of Birmingham, and she sings a lot with them with some of their jamming that they do at some of these places where they play, like the jam sessions on the Avenue. And I never have been over to Birmingham to see any of this, but they have some wonderful programs. Elnor is a huge hit. She sang some of the most wonderful songs from those eras of jazz and rhythm and blues was so big. Wow. She has some of those wonderful songs and sometimes she'll take requests and she's just, just lovely. She Beautiful really voice. is. So we're looking forward. I think in the cold weather that we're having and Mandy has on her vest and I have on my jacket today and with the cold weather that we're having, I think having a really bright, uh, energetic, wonderful kickoff is important. So we try to start off big and end up big, and in between we try to provide some wonderful learning experiences for you with some of the other programs that are coming. Everybody loves music, and everybody loves this group. They do. They play together. So they do. Well. Uh, the next program is Wednesday, January 21st, mm -hmm. and that is Jeffrey Benton, Life in Antebellum Montgomery. Right. And of course, that period there, and I'm, that's on the title there, so you'll know exactly what we're talking about before the Civil War, 1818 to 1860. And he has written about five books, on, mostly on the history of Montgomery. And that is an interesting period there before the Civil War because really that's uh, frontier time for Montgomery. And Montgomery was, he said, hey, it wasn't Moonlight and Magnolias <laughs> down in Montgomery, Alabama. And it certainly was not Bible Belt in Montgomery, Alabama. It was a sort of a rough, tough town and the people that came in off the federal road there, it was a wild and woolly sort of group. Oh, okay. And he said, of course, the, there, there was some culture in Montgomery and there were people who lived what they call up on the ridge and had the beautiful okay. garden, <laughs> gardens and the homes and all that kind of thing. 
But in Montgomery itself, per se, the downtown area, there were, of course, the, the taverns and uh, all the, the different things that they did for entertainment, the gambling, the carousing, and all that. But then they also had <clears throat> opera. They had uh, a lot of different things there to offer people that, you know, offered a degree of uh, sophistication. They had horse racing. They had theater. Okay. Uh, they had uh, the, some of those kind of things, the, uh, the lectures, the exhibits. So there was already an element of culture in Very Montgomery good. that has certainly survived. But knowing about a town kind of on the Federal Road, a town that was big, sprawling, wild, and woolly, uh, I think he will tell us a lot about how those people lived, the, the everyday lifestyle and all that. And that's going to be really interesting and different. Yeah, it will. I, I really like that. And he's a retired military guy who settled in Montgomery, and he has taught, uh, he has written, he has five books he's written for the newspaper, Montgomery Advertiser. Okay. So he's very familiar with uh, his subject, and I'm looking forward to seeing Jeffrey Benton. He is so highly recommended by the people at the Montgomery Museum and the people out of uh, the different agencies in Montgomery, so he's a wonderful presenter. Good, good. So, have, I, have we ever had him? Before? Never have. We've got some new presenters. We have three, I know three new presenters okay. this time, and I love trying somebody new, and we're rarely disappointed. Good. Well, great. We look forward to mm -hmm. that. Uh, January 28th, Stephen P. Brown, Landmark Federal Court Rulings on Religion in the Public Schools. Stephen Brown um, has a degree from the University of Virginia, and he's from up that way somewhere, as we say in the South. <laughs> and uh, he is in political <clears throat> science at Auburn University in the College of Liberal Arts, and he's taught there for quite a few years. He's an associate professor. But Stephen is an excellent uh, presenter. I've had him before, okay. and uh, he did a really good job for me about two years ago, uh, a program on one of the circuit riding judges. He does a lot with legal issues, and he really has a subject that I think is timely is. with talking about religion in the public schools. And one thing to remember about Stephen is that he is a scholar and he's not necessarily saying I'm for this or I'm against this, but what he has done is study all those landmark cases. He's looked at what happened during the Clinton administration when there was a, a, a big team that was put together to come up with some guidelines for what can and can't be done in the public school arena. What emerged from that, according to him, is something that is much more permissive than most people think. Oh. And he said what can be done in the public schools as far as religious freedom is concerned is much broader than many school people even are led to believe. Okay. So this morning I noticed on, on television that they were talking about a guy that had walked up to a kid that was last in the lunch line and he said, you know, oh, he that is last shall be first and yeah. he that is first shall be last, just saying something to the kid. Well, later the kid came back to him and said, where does that saying come from? And from that, apparently they had gotten into discussion about the scriptures and the Bible and Jesus, mm -hmm. the sayings of Jesus, and that comes out of Matthew, of course. Wow. And I, the guy wound up losing his job, and it's wow. making national news. Now, I don't know the particulars of that case, and there may be cases where uh, the, over, the reaction is, uh, fits the case. There may be cases where it's overkill. Okay. But whatever, however you feel about that, he's going to talk about the fact that most people are still unaware, I'm reading right here, unaware of the many legal ways in which students can express themselves religiously in the public schools. So I think that's timely, and I'm interested in let's looking at that and having him come in and talk to us about that. to clear that. up what, I mean, I... I may think I know, right. but it'll be good to hear from him what actually is true. Absolutely. I, I agree. I just think that's a wonderful thing for us to be talking about right now mm -hmm. in view of what's going on in the country. That's true. Uh, okay, we're up to February 4th, Sarah Bliss Wright, The Impact of the Feed Sack, Alabama Cotton and Bemis Bags Sewn into History. Do you know that Bemis Bags, I believe, if I'm not mistaken on my facts, they were probably the largest producer of the um, cloth bags in the United States oh, really? at one time. They were really, really huge in producing like feed sacks, fertilizer sacks, all of the above. Mm -hmm. Sarah Wright is a bliss from Talladega. Her father was a much beloved physician there for many years. And so, uh, you know, Sarah's, she's a Talladega girl. Mm -hmm. 
and she's gotten into she she did cultural arts and performing arts. She was an opera singer for about thirty years. Oh my goodness! But she got interested in textile <clears throat> arts, and in doing so, she looked back to her hometown, at the sack concept, mm -hmm. and she started looking at the ways that feed sacks and uh, flour sacks and sugar sacks and all those things have been used all these years by thrifty, frugal housewives right. by, back in those days, farm wives, whatever. So she's taking a look at, and she will bring some beautiful quilts and some pieces of craft okay. that have been done with that. And so I told her this morning, I had emailed her, and she asked about bringing some examples of things that have been done with those okay. sacks and bags, and of course, I think that's wonderful. But. I have pictures in the fourth grade of a fertilizer sack dress. In the fifth grade, I have my <laughs> picture in a fertilizer sack dress. And I'm going to try to gather up some of the things around where I have uh, aants who are long dead, who did bedspreads and oh, bed clothes be and all that. So I'm hoping we can get people to bring in some stuff, some examples of what, how big an impact mm -hmm. those sacks had. Because to start with, they were coarse, they were rough, they took the place of shipping in barrels and canisters. Mm -hmm had to be strong. They got thinner with the material. They learned how to, the sewing machine was invented. Oh, so they wow. learned to do the, the wonderful <clears throat> seams that would hold. And so all of a sudden the, the feed set companies and the fertilizer set people, they started coming in with solid colors, with prints, okay. and that opened a whole new world. You just went out to the shed out there and you looked at the fertilizer set and you knew what kind of dresses you were going to have <laughs> that year. So that is a subject that's dear to my heart because I was brought up on a cotton farm right. where the fertilizer sacks were very important <clears throat> to my mother and my grandmother and the flower sacks also. So my I'm mom. looking forward to her. She is just delightful. She has the best time with what she does uh -huh. and she'll have so many pictures and I just think it's going to be great. That's what I love to hear a speaker who is passionate about what they're speaking she about. She is. She is the she is the <coughs> curator for a huge quilt exhibit with the Humanities Foundation. She lives in Mobile, okay. but her sister Debbie Waller, uh, a librarian, she lives in Talladega, and so she comes home a lot to visit her siblings. Okay. So she was just glad to drive up and do this for us, and we're so happy to that have her come. It'll be great. It'll be interesting <coughs> to have a, a almost a hometown girl, mm -hmm. local girl. <clears throat> the next program is February 11th, The Experience of Creek Indian Removal. You know, I've tried to get this guy for a pretty good while. Okay. Uh, he teaches, he has a PhD in history from Auburn University, but he teaches over at the University of West Alabama. And so I, I never <clears throat> have been able to schedule him because I knew he really is good in his field. He's an expert on Indian okay. removal in that time period. But a lot of times his teaching schedule would interfere sure. with what he was doing. He's actually from Washington State. And so for him coming in from Washington State, uh, doing a PhD at Auburn and studying, I would imagine that that's a really objective look at Indian mm -hmm. removal coming in from somewhere else uh, where you're not thinking about what Grandma told you or what you've always <laughs> believed. And I really <clears throat> think that he's going to do a really good job. He's going to talk about when 23,000 Creek Indians were removed from basically this part of the country, Alabama, Georgia, and that kind of thing, and uh, most of them tried to get to Oklahoma. And it's a sad story in our history. Uh, it's a uh, very uh, sentimental thing to look at, the art that comes out of that period and all of the above. But if you remember what had happened, we had had the cotton boom of the 1830s, of course, after the cotton gin was invented. Mm -hmm. Cotton land became <clears throat> really important to the South. And of course, that was before the Civil War when, after, when the slave labor was freed. So there was a lot of pressure on the government to get the Indians out, to divide the land up, and people were coming in from, we were the frontier really, they were coming in from the Carolinas and claiming land and getting free land and all that. It's a great story. And I think for him to come in and tell it for us is going to be wonderful. We've had it before, but we never get tired of looking at our state's <coughs> history and looking back at that period of time. It's interesting. Right. And, and there's people, always th mm -hmm. new things to tell. New things to tell. And so I really believe that he's going to be great. He has a book that's going to be published this fall with the University of Nebraska Press. Okay. And believe you me, that's no dog. So he must really know his stuff for him to be able to to have the University of Nebraska Press come in and pick up his work and publish it like that. So okay. I'm looking forward to seeing Chris, ha I think he pronounces his name Haveman. Haveman. Okay. H-A-V-E-M-A-N. Well, and uh, he's young. He's a young guy. He looks like he might be in his 30s. 
So new presenter. Well, enjoy it. Good. I'm looking forward. Well, we'll take a quick break here and be back in just a few minutes to talk more about the Brown Bag Series. You've waited all year for this sale. Toyota Thon is on right now. And it's the Toyota of Silicaga Grand Reopening. You can get our lowest prices of the year today. We're your Silicaga Camry Connection. Right now, all new Toyota Camrys are discounted up to $6,000. All discounts clearly marked on vehicles. Don't miss this one Toyota Thon and the Toyota of Silicaga Grand Reopening. Online 24 7 at toyotaofsilicaga.com. Right Tire and Service on West Fort Williams in Sylacauga is the right place for you. We carry the right tires for your car. Goodyear, Cooper, General, Michelin, and lots more. Right Tire and Service is also your right choice when it comes to all of your automotive service needs. Whether it's an oil change, front end alignment, brake service, or air conditioner work, make the right choice the first time and stop by Right Tire and Service, Sylacauga. In central Alabama, 9,100 kids face going to bed hungry tonight. Hunger doesn't take a day off. There are kids right here, right now, that don't know where they'll get their next meal. Join Alabama Childhood Food Solutions and help put an end to childhood hunger in central Alabama. Make a difference. Donate today, by mail or online, to help ACFS feed hungry kids. There's no better time to share than now. Their next meal could come from you. There's one pharmacy that's so much more than just a drugstore. That's Marble City Pharmacy in Sylacauga. From cards for all occasions, a huge selection of gifts, even great exclusive Alabama and Auburn stuff, all kinds of household needs, and a complete selection of over-the-counter meds and supplies that you would expect. We are more than just a drugstore, but with our friendly courteous staff and all of our great extras, we ought to be your drugstore. We're Marble City Pharmacy in Ogletree Plaza. Any meal, any time, it's a Huddle House on Highway 280. From the popular Huddle House Signature Waffle to our big house breakfast, including gravy and biscuit and loaded hash browns, it's a Huddle House. Try our Philly Cheese Steak Omelet. It's a sure hit, too. Our big house sandwich combos include Huddle Burger and Country Fried Steak. And for lunch or dinner, it's the often requested chop steak with mushroom gravy. Starting to get hungry? Head to the Huddle House. Our friendly and experienced team await you. Huddle House, Highway 280, any meal, any time. Hello and welcome back to Library Connection. I'm Mandy Cantrell. Joining me today on the show is our Library Director, Dr. Shirley Spears. We're discussing the South First Bank Lecture Series, Brown Bag Series, called Turn Back Time. Uh, and we certainly want to thank South First Bank for their, their sponsorship of this program. It is wonderful. We're very appreciative of yes, what they do for us. Always. They've sponsored for several years for us. And um, they make the quality possible because we are able to ask people that we might not be able to bring in if we didn't have that sponsorship and somebody to help us with it and then we try to let people know that hey these are community minded people and, and we really appreciate them. We have so many sponsors out there and people that help make our library what it is so we just like to make it win-win and talk about them when we can and it, I feel the same about TV 47 and the other media that help us to get the word out because you know what they say about a you know a tree falls in the forest. <laughs> does anybody hear? <laughs> yeah. Does anybody hear? Does it really make a noise? So if you can't get the word out and you put all this effort and time into something, it might be futile. You may have a dozen people instead of right. sometimes we very frequently we have two hundred people out. If you haven't been coming out to that, you've missed a treat because we have some wonderful refreshments and fellowship from eleven till twelve, and then a really good always good presentation. Yes, always good. And I know you spend a lot of time, a lot of time and effort putting these together and we have a lot of uh, volunteers who work uh, oh, with them. We could not do without them. They're just wonderful. We have a team of volunteers that work with us to help uh, get the food out, uh, host the function and then later we have, of course you got to clean up mm -hmm. you know it's All a bad. lot there's a lot of work involved in, in doing this and I am planning the fall schedule right now I'm, I've already mm -hmm. scheduled three programs oh, good. so you do it many many months ahead to try to get the cream of the crop and try to get topics that people like and Speaking of Indians, which is yes. always very popular. <laughs> right. The next program, we have gotten down to Wednesday, February 18th, John Ellisor, The Second Creek War, Conflict on a Collapsing Frontier. Okay. And these two guys, Chris Haveman, that's doing Indian removal, and John Ellisor know each other. Oh. And they both <laughs> have PhDs from, um, well, 
uh, Ellisor has a PhD from Tennessee, but he teaches in Columbus at the college there, and he knows Chris Haveman very well. So when I started planning these programs, and he came up with the Second Creek War, that's his specialty. He has a book out it's, that's called The Second Creek War, Collusion on the Collapsing Frontier. Then I said, well, how do these things play out together? I mean, is there, are they too closely aligned? And they said, absolutely not. I know what he'll be doing, and he knows what I'll be doing. Oh, that's good. So he will set the stage. Chris Haveman will with the Indian removal, and then the Second Creek War came in 1836, when, in the process of trying to get these people out in the pockets that were left, they absolutely had a war. It was a conflict, mm -hmm. and so that's called the Second Creek War, and they'll get into what the Indians were doing actually to resist. Uh, <clears throat> they were dealing with grief over being uh, uprooted. Right. Uh, they were dealing with hardship. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, uh, many of them did rise up and try to defend their land and defend their status. And so <clears throat> this is what Ellisor will talk about. He will talk about uh, the fact that the Creek War has been neglected by historians, but it was more than just a skirmish. It was a real effort by the Indians to try their best. And I think that's an interesting aspect of Indian removal and of our Alabama history. Mm -hmm. So I wanted somebody who knows it as well as John Ellisor does to come in and take up where Chris Haveman leaves off with removal and talk about the impact of it. You know, what was the, what, what happened as a result of Indian removal? It's called the Second Creek War. So we'll be working with that with John Ellisor on February the uh, 18th. Right. So I'm look, really looking forward to John. I've tried to get him for several years also, and you just have to take your time, schedule these wonderful presenters when you can get them. I bet they are hard to get. I mean, if they're, they're sought after speakers. Right. They're, it's they're hard very, very for them to make their schedule work because they, a lot of them teach, right. and they are very committed to their students, and so they have to work it out when they can come, and sometimes you wait a year on them. Well, but they're, two. Worth, they're worth waiting for. Them. They're worth waiting for. <laughs> Next is February 25th, Dan Puckett, Alabama's Jewish serviceman in World War II. I was so excited about this program. I saw the article in the Alabama Heritage Magazine, and if you don't take the Alabama Heritage Magazine out there, you are missing a treat. It comes out four times a year, I believe, and it's sixteen ninety-five. It's a very reasonably priced magazine. It's just filled with color and illustrations and Alabama history <coughs> stories and so that is a truly wonderful magazine, and I saw this article on Alabama's Jewish servicemen in World War II, and it really hit me that I never had thought of the Jewish people participating in the war in the armed forces. Right. The only thing I had thought about was the Holocaust That's and right. how it impacted on the Jewish people. I hadn't really thought about the patriotic people out there in those communities like Sylacauga, Alabama, Alexander City, throughout the country where these guys stepped up and joined the Army or the Air Force mm -hmm. or the Navy. They joined in the fight against the Nazis. Okay. So this is what this program is about, and I understand that we had some from Silicaga from the Goldberg family. Oh, wow. And so it, it just is incredible how patriotic in many ways they were, and they knew what was going on because the press had covered it so well. And while they were not able to get in touch with many of them with their families back home right. to get first-hand information <clears throat> while they were beginning to round the, the, the Jewish people up, the press was covering it and they were hearing about it. And the very fact they couldn't contact their people, think about how scary that would be. That would be. To be here and your parents and your grandparents are back in Europe mm -hmm. and you can't get in touch with them and you know what's going on over there. You've read in the press that the Jews are being rounded up. So anyway, he knows a lot about that. He has a book out called In Hitler's uh, Shadow, In the Shadow of Hitler is what the name of it is, Alabama's Jews, the Second World War, and the Holocaust. But what he will talk about for us, and perhaps he'll come back and talk about the Holocaust, he'll be talking actually about the patriotic Jewish soldiers and the part that they played in World War II in defending our freedom. So I think that's going to be good. Is uh, He teaches at Troy State University, okay. and he is... He is quite a, a presenter and quite a scholar. I'm looking forward to having Dan Puckett. He lives down at Wee Tomka. Oh, 
Oh, not far. Not far. <laughs> That's good. That's going to be a good program. That'll be very interesting. <clears throat> and the final program, March 4th, Dolores Hydock. And I love this title. Money still talks, but it used to say a lot more. <laughs> she's always great with her titles, <laughs> she and is. she's better with her stories than she is her titles. So you know how good her stories would be. Yeah. But as I said, with us kicking off with music, a bright spot, and then winding up with Dolores Hydock with a story, she has for years. She's closed out every series we have, she and has. she loves Silicaga. She loves to come back. Uh, she does the best she can price-wise for us because she does love Silicago in our audience because they're such a great audience. They love her. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> they love her. So she does such a wonderful job. But she's been working, I know, with a lot of the Birmingham libraries for about three years now. They're doing tremendous studies on money and smart money and budgeting. And I think the economic downturn brought a lot of this on where these awesome. sponsorships come in to talk about money and to talk about budgeting and with, with young people, with families, with everyone. So they're smart. They got Dolores involved in uh, all these studies and programs they're doing in Birmingham. And she does story series on money and on budgeting and, the, oh, of course, the humorous and the wonderful hum human side of it. <laughs> so she has great stories about money and how it used to be that you could get you know, a dress for 50 cents or yeah. two, a pound of coffee for a quarter or whatever. She has great stories about money and how people used to handle their money and it will be funny. Uh, it will be uh, a home-based stories. It'll be stories about what how it used to be. Right. Turning back, <laughs> turning back time. Turning back time. And if you look at the newspapers and you look back at the ads, you can see what a different world it was. That, hey, they made, a, uh, they made $40 a week or maybe they made $80 a month but people could take their money and go out and buy so much more. So she's saying money used to say so much more. She puts a lot of time, I'm sure, into researching and all this before she... You know, comes. Dolores makes her living telling stories. And to me, that's a whole different ball game from someone who does things on the side. Yes. Maybe you have a real job and you go out and you do a program or two along for fun and a little extra money. She makes her living telling stories. She is a professional actress from Pennsylvania. She is beautiful. She's she's so delightful. She she's so compassionate. It's just hard to over describe her right. as a wonderful person and as one of the most talented people. Actually, the best storyteller I've ever seen. I think so. Yeah. So we're so blessed to have her as a friend yes. for Silicaga and for the library. So it's going to be great to see her talking about something that she's been talking about a lot, and that's money yes. and finance. She's made me laugh and made me cry. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> she's the best I've ever seen. Time. Well, we certainly hope you'll come. Our programs begin Wednesday, January 14th, and we'll kind of recap again. The, uh, the, the theme is Turn Back Time, Looking Back in Time, and our programs, program is at 12 noon in the auditorium at the library. Mm -hmm. At 11 o'clock are refreshments, and you're invited to bring a, 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 a sandwich, hence the brown bag name. Bring a sandwich, and there'll be other refreshments, mm -hmm. lots of people right. to help you. Good time to visit and mix and mingle with other people there, and then the program at 12, and it's over about 1 o'clock, so if you're coming on a lunch hour, it's perfect. A lot perfect of people time. do. They just kind of sit mm -hmm. close to the door, and they slide out, you know, when the time comes, but do we have a second left? Yes, I could say we do. something. Yes. Well, one thing that I'd like for people to do with all the hard work, all the money from South First and sponsors, all the food from volunteers, yes. you don't have to do anything except come. Right. That is so rewarding to us for you to do that. That's the payback for us right. is for you to come and try these programs. I hear people say, "Well, you know, I didn't think I'd like this program." Don't prejudge these programs. Just try right. them. Right. And many people will say, this is the best program I've ever seen here, and I didn't think I'd like it. Well, good. So if you don't try, you don't know, and you're learning, and it's painless, and you're getting out of the house, you're keeping your mind sharp, you're right. fighting off Alzheimer's. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All of the above, so I hope people will come. Well, thank you for joining us so much, and uh, please p pick up a flyer at the library or go on our website.